have anything that you'd like to add or comment, please interrupt me. Or at the end, I'm very happy for you to correct me or offer more information. Please feel free to do that. So good evening and thank you for joining us. What we know about ceramics changes constantly with new tools for analysis and new discoveries at archaeological sites, some of which you are involved in excavating. So truly, we're all learners. There are a number of old and new friends here, and some are extremely knowledgeable. So please add anything that I say to anything that I say during the course of the evening. I've called my talk, 10 Things You Want to Know About Chinese Ceramics. And I'll discuss 10 things that I believe are important to know in about 15 minutes. Another title would be Ceramics 101, or a thousand years of Chinese ceramics in an hour. So the 10 <laughs> things are, what are Chinese ceramics? Number one, I'll begin by defining ceramics and then ceramics that are Chinese. There are three general categories, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. Because there are three types of clay in China in each general types, and each requires a slightly different treatment and firing temperature. Number two, who made Chinese ceramics? Ceramics were usually made by potters at kilns that were often imperial workshops. Kilns were usually built close to the source of the clay, and whole villages worked in the business. Some manufacturing was seasonal, and both men and women participated. And these paintings are taken from a 18th century collection of drawings at the British Museum. That's the source of this series of paintings that you'll see others of. What was the purpose, number three, of Chinese ceramics? Daily use objects, depending on the time period, were usually earthenware and utilitarian, as you see in the top photograph. Ceramics were also made to sell either within China or overseas. Others were specifically made as gifts to visitors, foreign delegations, or to honor a person or place. And the most refined and special were for imperial use, the emperor and his court. Reasons four and five. When and where were the ceramics made through the successive Chinese dynasties? Can you all see in the back? No. Would you come forward, please? Whoever, whoever can, you guys who just came in, would you come up and join us at the front? There are two seats here. <laughs> so ceramics are classified by the name of the culture with which they are associated. Today we'll focus on Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing. Six, what are the themes in the five significant ceramic dynasties? I'll highlight the shapes and colors and designs from Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing. Seven, how were they made? Describe how ceramics were made and whose dioramas from the Longchuan Museum a kiln in Myanmar, and illustrations from the 19th century album at the British Museum. So two of our audience were at the Long Chen conference that I attended, Mr. Ho and Johannes. So you will see, you will see familiar places. Number eight, why are Chinese ceramics important? Because they are a dateable and unaltered record of history, trade, and taste over thousands of years. Number nine, what makes Chinese ceramics valuable? The source, provenance, quality, and rarity of a ceramic, and of course the market create value. We'll discuss each of these things. Lastly, how are Chinese ceramics appreciated? This will depend on your purpose, whether you're a scholar who looks at a piece to help you understand a place in history, a collector adding to a special part of his or her collection, or as a museum goer looking at an exhibition. Today, I'd like you to take home an understanding of the when and why ceramics were made, why they are decorated in the way they are, and an appreciation for shape and color. So let's begin with what are Chinese ceramics. <coughs> go there. Okay. 
Ceramics are objects made of clay mixed with water and other materials that are hardened by heat that were made in China. When ceramics from China were traded or sent to other parts of the world, the name of the place of the object became synonymous, and over time, ceramic wares from China were simply known as China. Have you ever wondered what the oldest ceramic <coughs> in the world is? The earliest ceramics were functional or for rituals, and we can date them to about 27,000 years ago. The oldest known ceramic object in the world is the Venus of Dolni Vestonici, dated 29,000 to 25,000 BC. It was discovered only in 1925 in Moravia. It's made of clay and fired at a low temperature. The word ceramic comes from the Mycenaean Greek word, word keramikos, meaning pottery or for pottery, or ceramos, meaning potter's clay, tile, or pottery. The earliest ceramics found in China are earthenware dated to about 20,000 years ago. There were pottery fragments of common clay shaped in utilitarian vessels that were heated in a fire and were used for storing, cooking, and serving food or carrying water. This is a recently dated shard from the Yangtze Basin of China in Jiangxi province. It's the earliest datable ceramic from China that we know of. Have you seen this before? Johannes, have you seen this this one before? This the earliest piece that has been identified. Early earthenware is porous, usually red or pale gray in color, has a matte, dull, dusty looking surface, usually has no glaze and is fired between 800 and 1150 degrees centigrade. This Yangzhou earthenware urn is made by coiling clay in rings, one upon the other, and painting the de decoration on a with a soft brush. The Han container on the right also has painted pigments. The earliest higher-fired glaze ceramics are stoneware. Known to be produced in China are green glaze stoneware from Shang and Zhou, and then Han Dynasty in Zhejiang and Jiangsu provinces. The pots were made from hard, durable local clay, washed with wood ash and fired in kilns at between 1200 and 1225 degrees centigrade. This technique produced a high-fired lime-based glaze. Porcelain is made from abundant porcelain stone deposits in certain parts of China. Porcelain stone is sometimes called kaolin or china clay. The china stone rocks have to be crushed with water to remove impurities. Once purified and mixed, the clay is formed into shapes and fired. Kaolin must be heated to between 1280 and 1500 degrees Celsius to become hard and translucent. Its melted surface becomes smooth and shiny so that a glaze is not needed. Porcelain was first produced in quantity in the Song Dynasty, and there are three characteristics of porcelain are that it's white, high-fired, and translucent. Although we now group all Chinese ceramics together, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, they were made, when they were made, they were for different uses by very different parts of society. Earthenware was normally made from local materials in the places the pots were used by local potters. So, people, so those of us that have been to Myanmar on our Sias trip saw earthenware made at a riverside by people who were using them right there along the river. Stoneware was made at kilns set up for the purpose of manufacturing for local use as well as for distribution. These are photos of a modern factory in Longchen like would have been scattered around China near clay deposits that were close to transportation, usually near a river. Porcelain would have been made at workshops that were very often controlled by the palace or court officials during each era. As I mentioned before, porcelain would be classified by the name of the culture with which they were associated. Tang for Tang, Song for Song, Ming for Ming, and Qing for Qing. 
The function and use of earthenware, stonewares, and porcelains varied from dynasty to dynasty. So they could be utilitarian, trade, tribute, ritual, or burial, or used only by the emperor and his court. We'll look at a selection by their quality and their era. Ceramics made for the domestic marker were usually made close to the source of the clay for the surrounding area. They were made of earthenware, stoneware, and utilitarian. From the Tang Dynasty, very little daily use ware survive because they were usually broken over the thousands of years. However, we can surmise what was used during that time from tomb finds and shipwrecks, like these at the top left that are dated to Tang. These two on the top left from found in the Belitung Ret that Singapore now owns and will hopefully be exhibited at some point in a museum. And what is the handwriting symbols? The handwriting, yeah. The, because, yeah, that was my job. That was my, my job is to do the first inventory. So, yeah, my, head ago, my handwriting yeah, is... Yeah, left hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Left hand. Yeah. So the economy of China has been supported by exports of ceramics, at least since the Tang Dynasty. There were overland and maritime trade routes, evidence of which continues to be discovered. The Belichung wreck that was purchased by Singapore is the earliest evidence of direct trade between China and the Middle East in the Tang Dynasty. The Song and Yan economies were supported by ceramic trade, and the development of yen, blue and white, was fueled by export trade. Large dishes would have been made for communal dining customs in the Middle East. For example, the piece on the left, the blue and white piece, is yen and would have been made for export to the Middle East. And the piece on the right would have been made for export to Southeast Asia. Porcelain in China was considered a rare and valuable commodity. Workshops were often controlled by the emperor, and porcelain was given and received as state gifts. In Tang, tribute to visiting dignitaries was often, often porcelain. Southern Song Ding wares were usually sent as tribute to the imperial court. A special Yue ware was found in a crypt under the Fa Menzi temple after an earthquake. Have any of you been to Fa Menzi? No, not yet. But, but we should do that. We should go. In the Yuan Dynasty, white ware with a Shu Fu mark was made especially for the Privy Council, which is a government bureau first established during the Tang. And the Long Chan Celadon ware from the Xinan shipwreck are carved with inscriptions reading for public use in the martial office. As is often the case, the best objects and businesses are controlled by the leaders of a country. Ceramics were no exception. Kilns enjoyed imperial patronage and were made to order and made to order the ceramic objects used in the palaces. Chinese imperial household records that survive show orders for specific types of ceramics for specific rooms in the palace. For example, in the Yuan Dynasty, Kublai Khan set up the Bureau of imperial manufacture to control the craftsmen who are employed to produce luxury goods for the imperial household. And we see examples of imperial ceramics in these slides. So for the purpose of this talk, I will limit my scope to the five major dynasties associated with ceramics in China. Tang, Song, Northern and Southern, Yuan, Ming, and Qing. During these periods, there were periods and geographic areas that were controlled by other rulers. Some of the more well-known are the Liao and Jin, and we don't have time to look at those today. And in the interest of time, I will summarize the themes, shape, decoration, and color of each ceramic dynasty after we look at maps and kiln locations. We'll start with the Tang. The boundaries of the Tang dynasty, dated 618 to 907, changed as the Tang emperors first acquired lands and then lost them. So here are two maps of the generally accepted boundaries of Tang dynasty. As you can see, it reduced over, over time. The major ceramic production areas during the 289 years 
of the Tang Dynasty were Ye and Longchuan in Zhejiang province, Xing and Ding in Hebei province, Changsha in Henan, Gongxian in Henan, Yajiao, Yajou in Jiangsu, and various kilns in Guangdong. You have to pardon my Chinese pronunciation <laughs> if it has an American accent. In Tang, the colors were created with iron, copper, and to a limited extent, cobalt. The typical colors were green, white, brown, black, and a kind of yellow, red, and sun blue. The shapes were clean and often imitated metal or stone. Northern white porcelain and southern green stoneware reached new heights. The typical shapes were bowls, plates, saucers, vases, pillows, guan jars, covered boxes, censers, inkstones, spittoons, and flasks. Sansai, which I don't have an example of here, is what we most commonly associate with Tang, was cheap and colorful lead-glazed funerary wear. So that's what made the Tang Rex so special, is we had an example, finally, of the best production of China that would have been used for daily wear, whereas before we usually only thought of the three-color funerary wear. Next we move to the Song Dynasty. The 167-year-long Song Dynasty, dated 960 to 1127, is divided into northern and southern Song periods. When the Jin invaders conquered territory in the north, the Song Emperor had to flee from his capital in Kaifeng to the south where he set up his southern capital in Hangzhou. So here we have the north and the south maps and then a gen, sort of a generic map of, map of the Song Dynasty. During the northern Song, numerous local kilns sprang up because the Song economy was booming and Song was exporting a great deal of ceramics. The most important kiln in the north was near the capital Kaifeng, making Ruware. How many of you are familiar with Ruware? Anybody seen a piece of Ruware? Albert, anybody been to the British Museum? Yeah, okay. It was less than 80 intact pieces are known to exist in the world today. During the Southern Song, the kilns continued producing for export and for the port, and the kiln making Ruware was lost to the invaders. So the kilns at Longchen created Guanware trying to achieve the same color and crackling pattern of rue. Kilns at Jingdezhen began producing large quantities of porcelain because of the large deposits of kaolin clay in the area. Come sit up in the front. There's a chair. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. This is my friend who from Sydney, who is a lawyer and uh, a ballet dancer. So yeah. <laughs> In the Song Dynasty, ceramics were generally understated and elegant monochromes. Ming connoisseurs later described Song imperial porcelain as the five classic wares, Ru, Jun, Ge, Ding, and Guan. So these are the basic ceramic things that you would associate with a song ceramic. The Yuan, the, the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Empire, lasted 90 years, from 1279 to 1368, and spread almost from Europe to Asia. The Yuan Dynasty supported craft production and favored textiles and other crafts that could be taxed, including ceramics. Ceramic production at Jingdezhen grew as the demand for export ceramics supported the economy. Blue and white ceramics, white ceramics, and greenware from the southern kilns were predominant. And that's something that we try to do in our handling sessions that we have twice a year, is bring in ceramics from different periods so that our members get used to touching them and feeling them and when you pick up a piece and it's blue and white and it's very thickly potted, 
you would think, oh, that really looks like a UN piece. So that when you're out looking at things, you at least feel like you can identify the shape or the color or the style from a particular period. So the Yuan Dynasty themes were basically blue and white and white because the Mongols were very fond of white uh, being sort of a holy color. So the ceramics were initially Qingbai, which is a light uh, greenish white, continuing the song tradition of making, uh, trying to imitate jade. And as the export increased, there were mostly blue and white ceramics made. And I'm skip over my very long description of Yen ceramics. If you only remember two things about Yuan ceramics, and you have two pieces that you think of, these are the two. They are the pair of Blue and David vases at the British Museum and the Fontil vase at the National Museum of Ireland on the right. The pair of vases were bought by Sir Percival David and donated to the foundation in London. They're unusual for their size and the fact that a date, 1351, appears just below the rim. And like I mentioned, if there was a dictionary of ceramics and there was only one entry for the, for the Yuan Dynasty, it would be the David vases. The other significant Yuan ceramic is the Fontil vase. And it's important because it has complete provenance that we'll discuss later. It's the earliest documented Chinese porcelain object to have reached Europe. It belonged to Louis the Great of Hungary, who received it from a Chinese emissary visiting Pope Benedict in 1338. So that was the time of the Crusades. It was given to Charles III of Naples, and later the owners included the Duke de Berry, the Grand Dauphin, who was the son of Louis XIV, William Beckford at Fontil Abbey, and John Farquhar, who made his fortune in Bengal. The vase was sold at a sale in Hamilton Palace in 1882 and lost to public view. And it resurfaced again by, and was bought by a dealer that sold it to the museum in Ireland. Now we move to the Ming Dynasty. Okay. The Ming Dynasty lasted 276 years, from 1368 to 1644, under 15 different emperors. It took over the Yuan kilns and kept Jingdezhen's status and his official producer of porcelain. The Ming Dynasty ceramic themes were for different consumers, imperial and export. The emperor had influence on the taste and designs, and obviously there were 15 emperors, each with his own taste. So for example, Zhang De liked Arab culture and the ceramics of his era reflect his taste. Fa Hua, which is on the upper left, looked like cloisonne and was used for architectural features. Polychrome overglaze enamel from Jing De Zhen was perfected. And then we have export wear. Croc became popular in Holland. Color painted design foreign shapes because Zhang He, um, because of Zhang He, who was the, gosh, I lost my train of thought, who was the eunuch, who was the, <laughs> The, the explorer and headed the maritime expeditions. Okay. The Qing Dynasty lasted 267 years, from 1644 to 1911. The ten emperors each influenced, influenced the style, color, and design of ceramics during their reigns. By the time of the Qing, the location of ceramic kilns and workshops were generally the same as previous dynasties. 
with high quality ceramic production concentrated in Jindajan. So here you see maps of the, what is generally accepted as the Qing Dynasty. The greatest achievement of Qing ceramics is pink enamel. It was later copied by Sèvres in France. Famille Rose became sought after and was considered the height of taste. This pair of pink wine cups in the British Museum would be the best single example of Qing ceramics. Have any of you seen this? It's in the Percival David collection, which now has its own special room. And I would encourage you, if you're ever in London, to go and spend an hour there. It's the best encycl encyclopedia of ceramics that you will ever find. So you guys that travel widely and frequently, make a, make a special trip there. So in the Qing Dynasty ceramic things, in 1608, at the end of the Ming Dynasty, the imperial production stopped and the workers were sent back to the palace. In 1683, the imperial kiln was rebuilt by the Qing Emperor. In general, the 17th century was a transitional period. The major ceramic production area was still in Jing to Zhen, and with the change in technology, there was an improvement in body material. The porcelain was harder and more translucent. The glaze was opaque white that was used as an excellent base for enamel painting that imitated ink painting. Other porcelain kilns were Dehua in Fujian province, producing, producing fine white porcelain sculptural figures, many of which we have in our ACM museum um, that you guys are familiar with. The Hickley collection is from Dehua. Export where to order was made with family crests and designs. Now we move on to how were Chinese ceramics made. Ceramic technology in China is regional. Different clays have different properties and require different firing types of firing. There are many variations of the process and I will describe the general steps. The first step is to make, a to make a ceramic is to choose the clay. For example, in Longchen there are over a hundred known kiln sites. Kilns choose clay from the places closest to them. The qualities of all kinds of clay are different and the content of the mineral substances like iron are also varied. Some clays need to be broken and pounded into powder. Then the powder needs to be washed to get rid of impurity like grass roots. This process is repeated several times to purify the clay, as you see in the top two illustrations. After washing, the clay is called refined clay, which is the material for making ceramics. The refined clay is not only more plastic, but also pure and smooth. Craftsmen grind porcelain clay or violet golden clay into a very fine powder by water-powered trip hammer. This gives the clay a high plasticity and viscosity. Still, after washing, the refined clay may have many bubbles inside, so the clay cannot be shaped well and the bubbles will affect the quality. So potters knead and beat the clay repeatedly. This is called pugging, which you see at the bottom. Because of pugging, the structure of clay becomes more dense and uniform, so it's easier to shape. Are any of you potters? Do any of you make clay objects? No. Because you would understand this, and it would be um, something that you would be interested to see the photographs of. So then, after preparing the clay, there are three methods of potting, which are throwing, molding, and shaping. Throwing is to shape the wet clay into round objects like bowls, plates, or pots on a revolving potter's wheel by stepping on a foot pedal. If the object is in irregular shape, it can be thrown part by part and in the end connected together. Molding is suitable for making many-sided vessels like tong-shaped vessels and hexagonal vessels. Each part is molded and then put together. Shaping means to shape or sculpt figures or animals by hand. 
After the ceramics are shaped, they must be fired at about 8.